first of all, as President, I join Father Ekman in welcoming you to this seminar once again. You mean really very much to us, especially those of you who frequent this institute and seminary every Saturday evening faithfully. And you are our messengers to the city regarding what is going on in this great institution. I don't want to repeat what uh, uh, Bishop Machado, who himself is a canonist, already enlightened you on. But a few remarks before, just to carry on something, I gave some handout, but you need not necessarily follow it. I will speak for some time, and then you can feel free to interact with me regarding your own difficulties, though there will be a panel discussion later. First of all, laity, the bishop said what it means to be a laity or Christ faithful. The Code of Canon Law, Canon 207, divides the whole people of God into two groups. By divine institution, some are called sacred ministers, they are also called clerics. All others are lay people. It is a negative definition. Who are the lay people? Lay people are those who are not clerics. That's what our Latin code, Canon 207, says. But then Lumen Gentium, number 31, puts it more beautifully. Who are strictly lay people? Don't only say they are not clerics. They are not clerics, all right? They are not religious. Another negative definition. And then, also, positively, who are the Christ faithful? Who are the lay people? Positively. They are those who participate in the threefold functions of teaching, sanctifying, and governing. By their baptism and confirmation, this is the positive definition of the lay people. You all here, and we clerics, all by our baptism and confirmation, we have the right and duty of participating in the mission of Christ. That we can never forget. And then more specifically, the same constitution says that the laity have a special character that is the secularity. Bishop Machado was telling how they have to go out all the areas, politics, science, religion, everywhere, the secular character of the laity. I can't go to a factory and work and then witness to the gospel. I can't be out in the media and witness to the gospel or be in politics. The laity have the secular character, transforming the world, permeating the world. Like a leaven, they fill the world with the values of the gospel. This is the positive definition of laity. Participating in the mission of Christ and then also having a special vocation to transform the world with the values of the gospel. That's laity. Now, we have to remember that the Code of Canon Law, which Father John Abraham spoke about, the Holy Father said, John Paul II said, we have an old Tamil song like, all that I want to speak, you also speak. <coughs> the code of canon law is told by Vatican II, all that I speak in pastoral language, theological language, you speak in juridical language. If you know the Vatican II, you are already knowledgeable about more than 50% of the code. The code has only translated the teaching of Vatican II in juridical terms. In that context, Vatican II, ecclesiology is, church is the people of God. Church is a communion. So many people think, diocese is a territory, Diocese is defined in Canon 3, 169. Diocese is the portion of the people of God. Diocese is not territory. Diocese is the portion of the people of God. Who is needed for the diocese? People of God must 
then a bishop with his collaborators prays. That's all. This is what his diocese. Canon 515 would define the parish. What is parish? Parish is a certain community of Christ's people. Parish means you always think there is a late church, Baptist street, whatever it may be. What is a parish? Parish is nothing but a certain community of the Christ faithful. Who else is needed? A priest is needed as the pastor. Two essential elements of parish. Destroy all the church buildings. Parish is still there. What is parish? Parish is a certain community. A community is there, priest is there. That's all. Parish. So this is the new teaching that Vatican II has rediscovered, not completely new. It was the teaching right from the Bible. We can never convert it. Who is a parish priest? Canon 519 would say the parish priest is the proper pastor of the parish entrusted to his care. Community entrusted to his care. What is his role? He exercised the triumvirate, the teaching, sanctifying, ungoverning functions. Can he exercise alone? Not at all. He has to exercise this threefold ministry with the cooperation of other priests and deacons. And then one more, with the assistance of the lay members of Christ's faithful. Indeed, we are grateful to Vatican II for re-emphasizing this. Who is the active subject? Most of the time we often think it is the parish priest is the acting subject, active subject. No, it is the whole parish community together with the parish priest that is the active subject. It is not that somebody has the monopoly of giving, all others have the monopoly of receiving. Whole community has to give. Whole community must become prophetic, priestly, kingly. That is the theology that we are all taught. My own professor, Pablo Francis, used to say, what is the role of the ministerial priesthood? We are all in ministerial priesthood. The ministerial priesthood is at the service of the common priesthood to become prophetic, to become priestly, to become shepherding or kingly. That is the role. Sometimes we forget it. All Christ faithful have a duty in the parish, in the diocese and in the church. That's why in this paper also I have put every part of the mystical body constitutes. You are all members of the mystical body. No part of the structure of a living body is merely passive. But as a share in the functions as well as the life of the body. Indeed, the organic union in this body and the structure of the members are so compact that the member who fails to make his proper contribution in the development of the church must be said to be useful neither to the church nor to himself. So you have to be useful to the community. You are called. That takes me straight away to the participatory structures. It is too short a time to explain everything. When you understand the church is the people of God, Church is a communion. It springs from the very nature of the church that we all have to work together. I often repeat this anecdote. For instance, you know, a, a famous American actor was called to a function of ex service managing. The actor was so busy, he said, I'm not able to set apart some time to attend this function. But reluctantly, he said, I will come there and be present with you for five minutes. But then when he started addressing, he went on for half an hour. Everybody was amused. Some of them were shocked. We organizers begged him. He said he will be present only for five minutes. But he goes on addressing for 30 minutes. And one of them dared to ask him, how is it that you could spend so much time with us? Yes, I wanted to finish my speech. But then I saw in the front row two men 
one without the left hand, the other without the right hand. As I started speaking, each of them joined the other hand and clapped. When I saw that, I wanted to talk a little more, spend time with them a little more. That was what happened, my dear brothers and sisters, when God sees us collaborating with the parish priest, collaborating with one another, he will have mercy on us and do marvels and miracles. Indeed, Jesus the Lord sent the disciples two by two. That's all. Sometimes people say the more councils, more meetings, more problems. So they are not practical. So if they are not practical, can we do away with them? Not at all. Councils, participatory structures spring from the very nature of the church, spring from the very identity as baptized Christians. Not because it is useful it should have parish council, but because it is the right of the people of God to contribute for the mission of the church, you should have parish council. Even if there is quarrel, problem, you should have structures of participation. Not merely individually, structurally, people must assert their identity. In that context, we have participatory structures, collegial structures at various levels. At the universal level, most important is the last ecumenical council we had, second Vatican council. All the bishops of the world, more than 2,000 at that time, now more than 5,000. All the bishops of the world gathering under the presidency of the Supreme Court. And then they have been having also synod of bishops. These are representatives of the bishops gathering under the leadership of Pope to discuss important issues that affect the church, that will contribute to the mission of the church. We have on the national level structure of participation, all the bishops of a country or a particular right gathering together. Conference of bishops, as we call it. In addition, regional bishops, all the Karnataka bishops also meet a collegial structure of participation, discussing issues that affect the uh, life of the church in Karnataka. And then we come to the diocese. One of the important things is first the diocese and synod, but very few dioceses have had synod, they have been invited to a number of dioceses to address the synod. The synod will help the bishop to reform, to renew the diocese, especially to help him to make the particular law. Canons 460 to 68, nine canons deal with the matter. Many a diocese has had a synod. It is like the general chapter of the religious almost. The general chapter is deliberative and it has legislative power. In the synod, only the bishop has. That's all the difference. Otherwise, representative of the whole diocese, the diocese and synod. Then for priests alone, we have two councils. For example, the Senate, the Council of Priests, the Presbyteral Council, as it is called. Representatives of the bishops, representatives of all the priests of the diocese, especially those who serve the diocese. Nearly half of them are elected by the Presbyterium. Some of them have their office ex officio, and some others are nominated by the bishop in order to make it as representative as possible. This is a body that is meant only for the priest. Canons 495 to 501 will speak about this council of priests. One more, Canon 502 speaks about the college of consultors. You have heard about them also. Consultors, some priests are consultors. They are chosen from among the presbyteral council, minimum of six, maximum of twelve. It is constituted for five years. For important matters, bishop has to consult them. In the matters of finance, he has to get their consent. Otherwise, he cannot sell a property or do an act of extraordinary administration. Can five or two will speak about it. These two participatory structures. And in addition, also at the diocesan level, you have diocesan finance council. Diocesan finance council. That is treated in Canon 492 to 494. Three canons speak about it. 492 to 494. What is it? It is a body of persons, Christ faithful. They may be priests, they may be religious, 
they will be lay people, minimum of at least three, who are appointed by the bishop for a term of five years to assist him in the administration of the finance in the diocese. They must have moral qualification, persons of integrity, they should have technical qualification, knowledgeable about law and finance. So, diocese and finance council, lay people can be appointed also. And the last canon in that section 49 speaks about diocese and finance officer who can be a lay person. I am told even the diocese of Udupi, a sister is the diocesan procurator. So, lay persons can be appointed as the diocesan finance officer also, the necessary qualification and all. This is a participatory structure, diocesan finance council. In addition, we have also the diocesan pastoral council. Diocesan pastoral council can file within 10 to 514 will deal with this diocesan pastoral council. Just as we have parish pastoral council. In fact, the parish pastoral council derives from the diocesan pastoral council. Dyson Pastoral Council must also consist of predominantly of lay people because it must represent the whole diocese. It is consultative all right, but then they will give suggestions, recommendations to the bishop. Normally, whenever suggestions are given, unless there is a serious overriding reason, any superior should not overlook such wonderful suggestions. Now, what concerns you more, my brothers and sisters, is the parish pastoral council and parish finance council. I come to that. Canon 536 speaks about the parish pastoral council. First of all, is it obligatory? The universal law does not make it obligatory. But diocese and law can make it obligatory. For example, in this diocese, Archbishop has made the constitution of the parish pastoral council obligatory. Who is the president? The parish priest is the president. Who are the members? The code itself says some should be necessarily members, for example, assistant parish priest, because he has a role in the parish. Maybe a permanent deacon or catechist, if they are there. They should be members, they should not be excluded. What about the other members? It must be representative of the whole parish. It must represent the whole parish. Different regions, different languages, different ministries, different professions. The parish pastoral council must represent the whole parish. How to choose them? So we always follow the principle of subsidiarity. There is only one canon before. What is the principle of subsidiarity? What should be done at the lower level should be done at that level without any reference to the higher level. The higher authority should not unnecessarily interfere in what is interested to the lower authority. Like that the Holy See doesn't want to decide how you choose the parish council members. It leaves it to the dais and bishop to formulate statutes taking into consideration the different problems that face the diocese. So, some may be elected. I think in the Archdiocese of Anglo, mostly it is appointed. It must be constituted for a specific term. But see to it that the whole parish is represented. What is its competence? Consultative. The code itself says it is only consultative. So many people have talked to me, Father, consultative, that's why I put it useless, so useless. Now, chaos, they consult and the priests do what they want. There is a beautiful canon, 127, which I teach sometimes for the postgraduate students for four hours, five hours, one little canon. It says, when advice is required, the superior's act will be invalid. If he does not hear the person, how the rain, what is important is he has to listen to the person. But he is not bound in any way to follow the advice literally. Nevertheless, 
unless there is a serious overriding reason, a superior should not go against the majority. So, my dear brothers and sisters, do not be discouraged. It is only consultative. It is not deliberative. It is not decisive. What is the use of going for the meeting? You know, Prophet Ezekiel is told by God himself. You tell this to them. They will not listen to you. Doesn't matter. You have told to know. They will be responsible. If you do not speak at all, you will be responsible. So that is the attitude we should have. This all goes back to the whole theology of power. Power of the priests and bishops does not come from the will of the people of God. Ultimately, we trace back the power, its source, to the ordination, the power of God. I am given the power not because the people want me in their parish, but because the Archbishop has appointed me in their parish. So do you think if everything is democratically decided, problems will not be there? Sometimes people say, what we need is not a democrat. We need a benign dictator, they say. Benign dictator, they say. You can't transfer the secular model of democracy into the church for each and everything. Some of our leaders are democratically elected, but still they disappoint us. They lose us. Same thing happens. So even by consultation, the people of God contribute. Sometimes they have a decisive vote in the finance council or parish finance council may have a greater say, still you contribute. Anyhow you have contributed, either by advice or by consent. Or at least by your presence, you always contribute. So parish pastoral council is an important way of participating in the life of the church. Then, based on our questions, I will clarify some other points. Then coming to the dais, Parish Finance Council, that is only again one canon in the court, canon 537. 537, Parish <coughs> Finance Council. First of all, it is obligatory, its establishment is a must in each parish. Suppose a parish priest says, my Sunday collection is only 60 rupees, not 60,000 rupees, as in some of the city parishes. Whether 60 rupees or 60,000 rupees, you should have a parish finance council. If you do not establish a parish finance council, then you are not obeying the Pope, the supreme law giver. That's the meaning. Recently, I went to address all the eight dioceses and representatives in Calcutta. I was surprised that some of them did not know the mandatory character of the parish finance council. They said, we are mission countries, we are not obliged to have parish finance council. No, one of the priests was asking. I said, the code of canon law binds all of India. Do not say mission country. The diocese bishop doesn't have power to exempt you from establishing a diocese finance council. Here again, it assists the parish priests in the administration of the ecclesiastical goods of the parish. It assists the parish priests. So, decision making. Do they have deliberative vote? I have put in that paper also. The diocesan law can say, in these matters, the finance committee must give the consent. In our own country, there are dioceses and dioceses. For example, in the diocese of Kota, Kota, only the lay people decide, they have a more decisive vote according to their statutes than in many other dioceses of Tamil Nadu. People decide, even to change the tube light, the parish finance committee has a greater say. But the power, the consultative vote or deliberative vote depends on the statutes, the particular law made for the diocese. Again, what is the qualification of the members? What is the term or tenure of the council? All these, how will they lose the membership? What are the functions of the office bearers in both these councils are to be determined. 
in the particular law or statutes of that uh, council which has to be approved by the bishop. In other ways also, the lay people are called to participate in so many ways in the parish, in sodalities, in teaching catechism, in choir. So many things only lay people alone can do. It is for the parish priests to tap the resources and in 275, after speaking about the priestly cooperation, clerical cooperation, paragraph 2 says, it is the duty of each and every priest to promote the role of the laity in the church. Let not priests and bishop think that they are the active subjects. The whole parish community is the active, active subject. And the difference between us and the other denominations is this primary. Why the Catholic Church is not growing as we expect? It is because there are only one or two actors, all the rest are us. All the rest are us. So they have their own group. And guiding so many councils have put some of the things towards the end. Maybe some of these points would be interesting. First of all, councils, are they useless since they are only consulted? I already said it, they are not useless, even if they are consulted. Secondly, who is victorious? The group with numerical majority should not consider itself victorious on the other group with less number and impose the will. Instead, in the church, both the majority and the minority must seek the truth and the good of the church and arrive at the ecclesial consensus. Such a consensus is not arrived at by the counting of votes, but by an encounter of faith. Yes. So we should try for consensus. Do not bulldoze the minority with your group majority, with your number. They have feelings. They have families. They have aspirations. Respect each and every one. Respect each and every one. Then, all councils are instruments of diaconia, service. Why are we there today, for example, the gospel this morning told us that we should not pray for the first place all the time. Even in the church, some people are very happy. They are standing first in the car procession, leading the car. Our attitude should be, Luke 17, 10, for instance, you also, having done all that is commanded of you, say, we are only unworthy servants. We have only done what is our duty. That should be our attitude. Instruments of diaconia, if at all the Lord asked us to learn something from Him, it is only that we may learn from Him who is meek and humble of heart. He not only said, when He instituted the Eucharist, do this in memory of me. He also said, after washing the feet of the apostles, he said, What I have done, you also go and do. We often remember only, do this in memory of me. But Jesus telling us, what I have done, what I did in washing the feet of my disciples, you also go and do. That most of us forget. All counsels are not to show off your one-upmanship, but to show that you are serving an institution, an instrument of diaconia. Then adequate preparation. Sometimes some parish priests uh, will do without any preparation, suddenly they will call for the parish council meeting. You should prepare, you should give the agenda. See, councils in the church must be well informed about their proper mission and well trained in the art of dialogue and planning. And in this context, we never had the custom of having an agenda. After Father Joseph Mathias became writer, every staff meeting he gives an agenda. It's a wonderful preparation. We simply take up something. We will know formally so many years. So we will know the agenda only on the spot. On the spot. Adequate preparation is needed for meeting. Otherwise, we will be only wasting time. So here it is given. They should be made aware of the basic theological and gospel foundation. Not only preparation for the meeting, preparation of the members. 
Here and there one or two parish councils called me also to address them regarding the parish master council and the finance council. Preparation of the members must be known, their competence must be known. Sometimes people don't know. Parish council means they can give orders to others, some people think. No, you cannot give orders. You cannot go against the teaching of the church, against the magisterium of the church. Adequate preparation, supply the necessary information. No meeting will come to any good conclusion, will bear fruit, unless you give the necessary information. You keep the people in dark. How can they comment on them? Supply the necessary information. And then, necessary atmosphere, there are some parish priests, I am not telling the parish priests, there are also some vice presidents who are lay people, or some other people who are more vocal, downplay others' opinions. Everybody should have the freedom to say what they want. Do not get agitated. Make space for your brothers and sisters. Even in Amoris Gatti said, the Holy Father says, dialogue means accepting the other unconditionally. Listening to the other patiently and attentively. So, necessary atmosphere. Even in the family, even in every setup, we need. And then also sincere sharing. Some of them want to be parish council members, finance committee members, but they are deaf, they are dumb, they don't see. They are happy because they are members. Parish pastoral council members and parish finance council members must be prophets, not puppets. They should not keep silence. I have repeated a number of times, Dante said, the artist place in hell is reserved for those who keep silence when they have to speak. <laughs> so sometimes you will say, I will not say anything. You will go to heaven, no, only to hell, because you did not speak. The youngest one is being beaten. You are keeping quiet in the family. You will go to hell only. You will go to hell. You have to speak. The heart has to be sincere sharing. Some people in the meeting, they will keep their mouth tightly shut. But then when they come outside the meeting, they will go on talking. But you are giving me a good suggestion. You are giving me a, uh, a right suggestion to the wrong person, the wrong place, my dear friend. Sincere sharing is called upon. You praise the parish priest, but you don't tell him what you are supposed to say. That's it. Meetings. And then again, say it with the reverence and the humility. Sometimes some people, even in the priest meetings, use abusive language. Canon 212 very beautifully says, whenever you speak, speak according to your competence. You don't know about something, if you ask me to speak about canon law, I can speak. Some other subject, I will not be able to speak. Speak according to your competence. Respect the dignity of individuals. Keep in mind the common good. Never go against faith and morals. And always keep in fact the respect and reverence due for the sacred pastors. Respect and reverence due for sacred pastors. That we should never forget. Because the parish priest or bishop has done something wrong according to your judgment. It doesn't mean you can use the singular and then abuse him. Sometimes we see. We should always respect the sacred pastors. It is not enough to care about what we say. What is more important is also, or equally important also, how we say. How we say. That's very important. Say it with reverence and humility. And then I am put, finally, let us promote participatory structures and communion. In spite of all the interest that the councils created soon after the Vatican II, and more so after the promulgation of the 1983 Code of Canon Law, there is today certain stagnation in the organization and functioning of the participatory structures. We should not 
accept passively the malfunctioning of the councils or renounce them altogether, what is needed is the formation of all the faithful in the understanding of ecclesial communion and the cordial openness and trust of those in positions of responsibility in eliciting the collaboration or co-responsibility of all in the decision making. So I finish with this, I open to any questions. Thank you.